Well, if you have your section of scriptures, we'll turn into Jonah. We've been in Jonah for a while. I'm hoping that you're bringing your Bible so that it will automatically turn to Jonah. It seems like I go to Jonah a lot for a lot of different things, and this is one of those sermons that I'm giving to you from the depths of my heart as passionately as I possibly can. This one, uh, this topic here that we're talking about is uh, near and dear to my heart. I'm hoping that I can articulate it well. It'll be understood as just a simple truth, but hopefully a life-changing truth for you as it is for me. I didn't bother creating a slideshow this week. I decided to give a couple extra hours to my nephews and we uh, be able to spend some time together and love on them. And um, I'm just so grateful that they're with us this morning. The topic that we're talking about is Jonah's spiritual life. And again, I don't want to crucify Jonah. Jonah is one of us. Jonah is a sinner. Uh, he had an awesome responsibility to, to preach the word, <clears throat> preach the word of God. And uh, he's doing it um, with a struggle in his heart. And we've been kind of talking about that and uh, helping to understand um, the love of God and the effects of sin and how God works despite uh, all of our weaknesses and our sins. We see all of this in the book of Jonah. But we've been dedicating the time that we have uh, talking about the progression of sin. There is a real progression, I believe, when it comes to sin. One weak step in the wrong direction turns into another step in the wrong direction, turns into a life of misery and and we're going to see some of that uh, again as we continue to talk about this downward spiral of sin. From my previous weeks, I just want to remind you that, number one, uh, as we look at this book, we realize that in our sin, the very first thing that we do when we are sinners, we just become stupid. We just become daft. We just become silly, foolish. We just act like a kid. It doesn't matter uh, how old we are. We can be 44 and still act like a two-year-old, all right? Um, and in sin, we, we often do that. And here uh, we see in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it. That is, that is my, my desire for your life, to preach against the wickedness, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah negated the word of the Lord, rose up to flee Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. And this is where he's being daft. You cannot escape the presence of the Lord. Now, I don't care where you make your bed. Whether it's here in this church this morning, whether it's at your house, whether it's uh, in a subway in the bottoms of New York City or in hell itself, um, uh, God is everywhere. And uh, you can't escape the presence of God. So that was Jonah's first step into the wrong direction is that he was just being daft. The second thing is he created distance. And so not only in verse 3 do we see that, but Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the verse continues, so he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare and went down into uh, it with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And so Jonah here in this moment is creating distance. And that often is the second thing that we do when we're struggling with sin is that we create distance. We know what we should do. We're not doing what we know we should do. So not only did we create distance between the God of the universe, but because sin is sin, it naturally just creates distance between us and even our loved ones. And here we see uh, Jonah escaping even from his town, from the people who care about him, from all of his mentors and spiritual advisors, maybe from his family, maybe from his wife, from his children. I mean, who knows exactly how old Jonah is here in this moment. But in this attempt to not do what God clearly asked him to do, he is putting distance between him and everybody else as well. And we often do that in our sin. I should say we do that every time in our sin. Is uh, Whatever that small sin is, it creates distance. The third thing that we talked about last week was just dumb luck. All right. So when it says, but Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, so he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish. That idea of found there isn't necessarily that word meaning determined. Like Jonah went there determined to find a ship going specifically to Tarshish, but rather it was happenstance. It was dumb luck, if you will, that he found a ship and that ship would take him as far as you possibly could go 
if you thought you could go from the presence of the Lord. Uh, that ship would take him 2,000 miles through the Mediterranean and up around Spain. Coincidentally, it was dumb luck that he could find a ship going as far as he did from the presence of the Lord. And we talked about this last week, that as we start making foolish decisions, and as we start creating distance between us and ourselves, we often find sin so easily available. It just lies around. You can pick it up anywhere. And we're like, oh, how coincidental that this is here for me. I must be moving in the right direction. No. God is sovereign. He's probably made that so easy for you to obtain so that you can be tested by the simplest things first. And this is a very simple decision for Jonah. Here's a ship. It just happens to be there. You don't need to board it. You could, you could turn around and do exactly what I want you to do in this moment or not. But it's a test, you know. And our God isn't a God of leading us into temptation, but we, are, we do have a God who does lead us to testing of our faith. And we read that in the Old Testament last week. There's also one verse that I could have given you uh, last week, and that was Genesis chapter 4, 6. Uh, if you want to turn there with me, you can. But here, uh, God is talking to Cain, and uh, Cain is obviously upset with his brother, and he uh, is making steps in the wrong direction, and the Lord is trying to just... Give him some simple advice. And we see this in verse 6 of chapter 4 of Genesis, where he says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is for you, but you must master it. I mean, it's, it's right there. As soon as you walk out of the threshold of this building, it's possible that sin is there waiting for you, saying, thank God you're out of that place. Let's, let's go do something fun now, whatever that, whatever that may be, all right? Uh, likewise, uh, sin may be, even be in the building. Perhaps even this morning, you're trying to create distance from, the, from you in this uncomfortable conversation. It's just dumb luck that there's something in your pocket that you can play with. I don't know. I mean, you can decide for yourself, uh, what that test may be for you in this moment. But as sinners, as humans, we can often see the easy, the easy way out and we just say, God wills it. God wills the easy way for me to do whatever I want to do. I just want to encourage you that God may have willed it for your life, but might have willed it from the sense that here is a test. Do you love me? Do you love my word? Will you pay attention to me or will you do your own thing? We often forget that Maybe not forget, but we do need to be reminded over and over again that God offers not only salvation, but he also offers us freedom. And on Memorial Day, freedom is a big concept to be had. I did go to the Memorial Day parade, initially rather reluctantly, but joyfully in the sense I got to spend time with my family and my nephews. But I, I'll have to admit, I was standing at the sidewalk of the Memorial Day service in Waterloo and I was getting emotional. Because here they paraded veteran after veteran and veteran after veteran and veteran from every generation, the, the sons of liberty and, and their colonial dress and veterans going down in wheelchairs and the rest of it. And I just got so emotional standing there thinking about the price of freedom. And God offers us salvation and he offers us freedom in the sense that we can follow him or not, or you can follow sin or not. But we have to make those choices. If you are his, the freedom allows you the opportunity to be unshackled and set free from the prisons of sin. And I think all of us have maybe experienced one or two of those prisons that have held us back, contained us, changed our thinking, made us rotten, made us miserable, whatever the case may be. Uh, it can be not only spiritual, it can also be a uh, uh, emotional prison. It can also be a spiritual prison. And, and, and Christ allows us the freedom to break away out of those prisons and, and be set free. But in the same token, we need to choose uh, to live a life that is in relationship to him. Um, and likewise, life in the Lord, if you do turn your life over to Jesus Christ, it do, he does not promising you a million dollars in the bank. Okay. <laughs> He's not He's not promising you prosperity. I know that gospel is out there today, uh, where if you turn your life over to Christ, everything in your life is just going to be easy peasy. You know, everything is just going to happen perfectly. Now, I think 
that's not the case at all. I think if you have a father who loves you, then you understand what true discipline is. And if, because a father loves you, he will call you out and he will challenge you to think differently and ask you to repent and ask you to turn a course in your life that will help you grow. And in our life with the Lord, uh, we need to accept that. And hopefully we need to joyfully accept it in the sense that you know in those moments that you truly do have a God who loves you and will not you, let you escape into uh, the hard realities of uh, sin and a life apart for him from eternity. This week, then, we continue on in the do- downward spiral of sin. And as we've already started, let me just continue reading. Uh, begin, well, let's begin back in verse 1. The word of the, Lord of, Jonah, Lord, word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. Verse 3, But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, And here's the section of our verse we're going to talk about today. Paid the fare, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. This is the next step in our sin. Okay? Foolish, distance, dumb luck, now you pay. Now you've got to make a decision on what kind of deals you want in this life. What we're talking about here is is dealing. I'm trying to start everything with D. Or you could say, here, you get real deliberate about your sin. You're going to start making transactions with you and this sin. And you're going to get deliberate, and you're going to start creating deals. And uh, here, really, uh, the wheels just start spinning, and you start heading in the the direction that you shouldn't be going in. Um, If we are here in our sin, where we could make a deal with the devil, so to speak, uh, then there is no doubt what your intention is is you have been tempted you have thought foolishly you have prepared yourself to be distant from god and others you see the opportunity for sin and today you pay something in the completion of that act and that's the real thrust of today's sermon you do pay something in the completion of that act paying the fare is representative of the act of dealing in the black market or dealing in sin. Okay. Perhaps we could think of it like this, how a undercover police officer uh, may see it on the street, right? They watch a person be foolish. Here comes some poor soul coming down the street on the wrong side of town where people make terrible choices to sin. The officer's kind of sitting there and watching it. Like, here it comes. I can feel it. But they wait to make an arrest till they see the exchange, whether it's money or, or drugs or whatever, because it's in the exchange that your intention is set. You have decided, you know, what is right and what is wrong and how you want to deal in sin. Rather than giving that to you only in today's context. Let me give it to you in the context of the Bible. If you want to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 7, I do want to read a lot of scripture today. Proverbs 7 is a good one to look into because it's uh, in your face as far as one sin that is relevant to our culture and one sin that's easy for any man or woman to fall into. And I want to read the chapter. So... Proverbs chapter 7, beginning verse 1, says, My son, keep my words and treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live, and my teaching is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister, and call understanding your intimate friend, that they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters you with her words. For at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice, and I saw among the naive, the naive, and discerned among the youths, a youth, a young man, lacking sense, just being an idiot, foolish, stupid, passing through the street near her corner, and he takes the way to her house. Hmm. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness, and behold, a woman comes to meet him dressed as a harlot, 
and cunning of heart. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks by every corner. So she seizes him and kisses him. And with a brazen face, she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings today. I have paid my vows. Therefore, I have come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt. I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. For, for my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him. At the full moon, he will come home. With her many persuasions, she entices him. And with her flattering lips, she seduces him. Suddenly, he follows her as an ox going to the slaughter, as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool, until an arrow pieces through his liver. As a bird hastens to the snare, so he does not know that it will cost him his life. Now, therefore, my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for many are the victims that she has cast down, and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, or El, descending to the chambers of death. In this idea of dealing uh, in sin and being deliberate, obviously we can in the backdrop of this, see, see this fool going in all the wrong directions. But here specifically today, we're talking about the deal and what it costs. And I think there's a verse here that kind of chimes in on it. Uh, and that is in verse 22, which says, Suddenly he follows her as an ox going to the slaughter, or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool. I'm looking for another translation here. Does anybody else have another translation um, that actually uses the word cost? If you see it in your translation, do you mind just reading it for us? Verse 22, Proverbs 7, verse 22. Ah, that would make more sense. And that is what my notes in my Bible says as well. I got a little distracted there. It's like, there, I must have been reading a version here and I don't have the right version on my paper. Thank you for that. Yeah, verse 23 would be the most uh, ideal one. Until an arrow pierces through his, silver, his liver as a bird hastens to the snare, so he does not know that it will cost, it will cost him his life. You know, there's a cost to sin. Here this man is dealing in sin. It is going to... He is going to exchange his life for some stupid temporary pleasure. Just like that. Right? Just like that. The cost of sin is actually also articulated in Proverbs chapter 5. So if you wanted to slip over there, and I'll just give you the first 14 verses. Where it talks about the pitfalls of immorality. It says, My son, give attention to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding. This is chapter 5, verse 2, that you may observe discretion and your lips may reserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey and smoother than oil in her speech, but in the end she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol or hell. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways are unstable. She does not know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, or you will give your vigor to others and your years to the cruel one. Here you see the exchange, and strangers will be filled with your strength, and your hard-earned goods, your hard-earned goods will go to the house of an alien, And you groan at your final end when your flesh and your body are consumed. And you say, how I have hated instruction and my heart spurned reproof. I have not listened to the voice of my teachers nor inclined my ear to my instructors. I was almost in utter ruin in the midst of the assembly and the congregation. 
And here again, uh, even in verse 10 there, we see this idea of your hard-earned possessions will go to the house of a foreigner. The reality is sin has a price. In American culture, we know the price of sin very well. Uh, not only do we have a lot of broken marriages in this world, but in those broken marriages, if you uh, have ever had one, I, I pray that pray that you never have to experience that. But uh, if there are kids involved and all the rest of it, some of your hard-earned goods goes, goes away from you. Uh, it's very hard to recover, uh, even financially, from some of the sins that you've had if, for example, you've chosen to be an adulterer and enter the arms of a foreign woman who is not your own. Sin has a price. You will be dealing with that sin for a very, very long time. Um, it's a deal that you will make where you give away something good and in return receive something temporary or bad, probably both, right? Um, this idea of exchange is also finds itself in uh, our New Testament. Romans chapter 1, if you want to go there. We see the hard reality of sinners and their choice of what they want to exchange. Now, we're talking about adultery here this morning, but adultery is just a very generic term uh, in the sense that you could be adulterous against your God for putting whatever idol that you have in your life in front of him. It doesn't necessarily need to be a woman. Some of us have an idol in a different regard. Our love for that idol, if it overtakes our love for our God, it's an adulterous relationship here. Okay. Um, Romans 1.25, we kind of see that in this context. In verse 25, it says, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They exchanged it. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So whatever that idol may be to us, it's that exchange that we experience where we take all the blessings that God wants to give us and we say, nah, I'm, I'm going to exchange all that for this pile of rubble <laughs> because it looks so good in this moment. We know that this has been the issue of mankind since the beginning. This is not a new issue. This is the oldest issue of all humanity, where we make an exchange. We pay the fare. We tumble down into a life of distress that wasn't designed for us. And to that point, we can go right back to the beginning of God's word in Genesis chapter 3, and we can exchange, see the exchange that happened way back then, where quite literally in my text, it talks about the fall of man. And here we read in verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it, or you touch it, or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. So here's an interesting thing. The consequences that are associated with disobeying God are not real. Um, you, can, you can do things your own way. Verse 5, For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and that you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so there becomes a temptation, you know. Uh, we can change the image and glory of God, um, which is something that we can that we can have. We, we are created in the image of God. Um, we can experience uh, God's glory in the sense that when we walk with him and, and live by his truths, uh, we can live a life of blessing and uh, live in his, his uh, precious fellowship. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took it. She exchanged it. She exchanged everything that God had given them in that moment for something that she thought would give her greater life, greater meaning, greater something. Uh, and whatever way that the serpent 
instructed her. She thought that being like God was so much better than being created in the image of God. And I wondered in that moment whether or not being like God just means if I can sit on the throne versus God, hey, that sounds pretty good. You know, if God is the ultimate authority and I don't like being restricted and I have an opportunity to be like God and be the authority, hey, maybe I'll do that. I can be like a God. I can rule my own affairs and rule my own life. And unfortunately, we know that that is the exact same thing that caused the fall of Satan. Uh, he saw God, saw everything that God was ruling over, and his desire was to be not only like God, but above God. Uh, and, so much, and so much sin has come from that point. I want to take you to one other story from the Old Testament. Um, uh, develop this maybe in the context of some other situation that we find in the Old Testament. And for that, we're already in Genesis, so I'll just have you turn to Genesis chapter 38. Genesis chapter 38. Again, I'm just kind of beating the drum of the exchange, of the dealing in sin, of the, of the cost of it. And here, we're going to talk about one of Jesus' great, 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 great granddaddies, who uh, it can be an example of exchanging or dealing um, to commit a sin. Genesis chapter 38, the first few verses are kind of hard to understand. I'll just say it to you this way. Um, back in the days of Israel living in the promised land, your name and your lineage, your, your descendants, uh, were given a great gift and that you owned part of the land. Um, your descendants really mattered in the sense that it stabilized your family and, and your culture. Here in this time period, even though it's hard for us to understand, um, uh, God designed it so that if one woman became a widow and there was still a possibility that she could bear children, that the brother of the widow would have relationships with her and they would produce more children and it stabilized that name in that, in that area and the, the lineage was able to continue in a very positive and prosperous way. Again, in this, in this context, in our day and age, it's hard for us to understand that, okay? And uh, you're just going to have to leave it there as, as something that you can only take by faith. And uh, thank God we don't live in that day and age anymore. But um, anyway, let me, just, let me just use that as a backdrop to verse 1 here, okay? Genesis chapter 38 and verse 1. It says, And it came about at a time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adolamite, whose name was Hira. Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite woman, whose name was Shua. And he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he named him Ur. Then she conceived again and bore a son, named him Onan. She bore still another son and named him Shelah. And it was at Chezeb that she bore him. Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, and so the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her, and raise up offspring for your brother. Verse 9, Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So he went out to his brother's wife. He wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. But when he, but what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so God took his life also. Verse 11, Then Judah said to his daughter-in-law, Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I'm afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. Verse 12, Now after a considerable time, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. It was told to Tamar, Behold, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she removed her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in the gateway of Venaim, which is on the road to Timnah. 
For she saw that Sheila had grown up and she had not been given to him as his wife, her wife. Verse 15, then Judah saw her. He thought she was a harlot, for she had covered her face. So he turned aside to her by the road and said, here now, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, what will you give me that you may have these sexual relationships with me? Verse 17, and he said, therefore, I will send you a young goat from the flock. I don't know why that sounds so promising, but I don't know. I will send you a young goat from the flock. She said, moreover, will you give me a pledge until you send it? And he said, what pledge shall I give you? And she said, your seal and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. And so he gave them to her and had her these relationships with her and, conce and she conceived by him. Then she arose and departed and removed her veil and put on the widow's garments. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend to the Adullamite to receive the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. He asked the men of her place, saying, Where is the temple prostitute who was by the road in Anayim? And they said to her, But they said, There has been no temple prostitute here. So he turned to Judah and said, I did not find her. And furthermore, the men of the place said, There has been no temple prostitute here. Then, Jesus, then Judah said, Let her keep them. Otherwise, we will become a laughingstock. After all, I sent this young goat, but you did not find her. Now it was about three months later that Judah was informed, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot. And behold, she is also with child by harlotry. Then Judah said, bring her out here and let her be burned! Exclamation point. It was while she was being brought out that she sent to her father-in-law saying, I am with child by the man to whose these things belong. And she said, please examine and see whose signet ring and cords and staff are these? Well, Judah recognized them and said, She is more righteous than I. And as much as I did not give her to my son, Sheila, and he did not have relationships with her again. We'll just stop right there. Uh, Judah saw an opportunity to sin as being a fool. Um, and he made a deal with this young lady not knowing that it was her daughter-in-law. And he put into her hands the signet ring, the cord, and his staff. The, as I was reading through this, my question became, what does the signet, the cord, and the staff actually represent? I mean, there's got to be some, something pretty cool here for us to be able to look at. The answer, I think, is found uh, in Numbers chapter 17 as far as one of those goes. So if you want to leave your finger here and go to Numbers chapter 17, I want to just give you the idea behind the staff. And if you have a heading in your section of scriptures like I do, then you know that this is the story about Aaron's rod budding. And maybe to that point, I don't actually have to read this section of scripture. But what we do remember from this section of scripture is that there was a great rebellion that was going on. And the rebellion was they wanted to displace leadership from their position. And every man thought that they could do such a better job than Moses and Aaron were doing. And so God called them out on it. Each man was to, uh, from each family were to bring a staff and the one that God chose to bless, he would make that staff bud, okay? That staff then served as a sign and means of arbitration and decision in the controversy between Moses and Aaron and Korah and his followers. In other words, that staff budding, that staff having a place, it wasn't just a random stick that helps you walk. It was a very important sign to the Jewish people of leadership, of power, and of authority. Okay? So that's pretty interesting that Judah would make an exchange of a staff, knowing that it was a pretty weighty part of his man arsenal, if you will. He's, he's giving something important that defines him as a leader uh, away in order for him to commit a sin. So he's exchanging that crazy thing. Then you see the signet ring or the cord and also the staff 
uh, represents the emblems of an individual's personal status, much like an ancient identity card. I mean, you've seen the rings in the old, in the, uh, old world, right? Like, if you push your ring into a wax seal, that really meant something. Uh, that was your way of saying, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement. This is who I am. This is, this is my, if you will, identity card into this place. So why Judah would give away such important things in his life, uh, other than just because he was a fool? Uh, I, I don't know why he would do that, but he did. He gave away his power and his authority. He gave away his identity card to a harlot. Verse 23, then, of Genesis chapter 38 becomes uh, an important realization for Judah in the sense that he cannot resolve what he had done, and he knows continuing to pursue the prostitute will only expose his shame in going to that prostitute in the first place. If you just look at it in Genesis 38 and verse 23, uh, and the New American Standard Bible says, Then Judas said, Let her keep them, otherwise we'll become a laughingstock. After all, I sent this young goat, but did not find her. In other words, he wanted to just create a new staff or create a new signet ring. He just wanted to walk away from the situation as fast as he can because he knew that for as long as he pursued this thing, people would get wind of it and he would become the laughingstock of his community. That he would do such a crazy thing, like give away these very important elements in the Jewish life to a harlot. So he's trying to save himself some shame, if you will, by not pursuing this thing anymore because he didn't want to be the laughing stock of his community. And, and the King James Version there in the same way says, and Judah said, let her take to it. Let, I mean, let her just keep this stuff lest we be shamed. And of course, sexual sin is probably the most shameful kind of sin. Um, people who have fallen into sexual sins, the, the, the shame is... is is so big, it's so overpowering that it's really hard to come out from underneath of that. Um, but sin is so much more costly than just shame, right? It also affects the everyday life and how we live with others. And in Genesis chapter 38, 24 through 26, we see this being played out in the sense that here, Tamra is... is uh, uh, considered to be playing the harlot, verse 24. Now, it came about three months later that Judah was informed, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot. And behold, she also uh, was with child by harlotry. Then Judah said, bring, to, bring her out and let her be burned. It was while she was being brought out that she said to her father-in-law, saying, I'm with child by the man to whom these things belong. And she said, please examine and see what signet ring cords and staff are these. And Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I. And as much as I did not give her to my son, Sheila, and she did not, she did not have relationships with her again. But here the idea here is, as far as how this affects everyday life and how we live with other peoples, Judah in this moment, um, his sin cost him his authority as a leader. Now, at least in this situation, but you know, likely not forever, but definitely temporary in this moment, and that killing Tamar would have been a righteous action taken by a righteous leader in that day and in that law setting, okay? However, her life was spared through the revelation that Judah was a greater sinner than her, you know? And so this exchange that he had with a prostitute, had, had this exchange with a harlot, actually eroded his leadership ability. Instead of the people setting her on fire, he had no, he had, he lost his, his ability to resonate with the people. He, he, he lost his authority. He lost his ability to make those kind of decisions in this moment. And I, and I think that we see this all, all the time in the world that we live in. You know, regardless of your the president of the United States <laughs> or a pastor or an elder or a CEO or a company manager uh, or even a mom and a dad. I mean, let's just break it down brass tacks here. Even as a mom or a dad, your authority and your respect can be lost temporarily or permanently by just one wholly unrighteous action, right? Just one. And just like Donald Trump, I'm not, I'm not saying anything great or bad or whatever about Donald Trump, but how long have we been parading that whole conversation about one unrighteous action? Like we're hoping, or people are hoping as a nation, that that would somehow erode his ability to lead in some remarkable way.
the reality here is it's very hard to overcome things like this. Like once you've created a great sin, once you've made this kind of exchange, um, you, may, you, may, you may lose leadership forever, you know? Um, to the point of, in a very just simple way, if you could pride yourself on being a teacher, but you have no students, are you actually a teacher? No, right? And if you were a leader leading and you have no followers, are you really a leader? Leader of what? Oh, these matchbox cars are sitting over here. Like, oh. yeah. But it's, it's, it's kind of scary what sin does to us. In a blink of an eye, our identity can be permanently wrapped up into a sin, kind of like wearing the scarlet letter. And people may always consider you first by that sin that they saw. In Judah's case, we don't ever consider him an adulterer. I mean, when you think about Judah... And all the times you think about Judah, like on a regular basis, we don't attach adulterer to him, even though that was his sin. You ever think about that? I mean, Judah is a strong name. Judah is a good name. Not because he never sinned, but because he had a proper humility about his own righteousness. And we see this in verse 26. And Judah recognized them, and he said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son, Sheila. And he did not have relationships with her again. Judah is really saved by his humility, right? Judah is saved by not continuing on in the condemnation of Tamar. Judah is saved by true repentance, noted in the text by saying he did not have relationships with her again. That was a mistake. I'm never going there again. Right? The name of Judah, unlike the name of Judas, <laughs> is saved by his humility and by his change of course. You know, uh, I believe Judah, after this moment, keeps leading. Whereas we know Judas, the traitor to Christ, is overcome by evil and despair and kills himself and his career as an apostle of Jesus. I mean, that's the inevitable, inevitable path of someone who is overcome by sin and overcome by despair. Unfortunately for Jonah, if we go back to Jonah now, here, let me, Pastor, where, where, where are you going on this whole thing? If you look at Jonah chapter 1, okay, after the major prophets, into the minor prophets. There it is, Jonah chapter 1. I want to read to you Jonah chapter 4. And just listen to this testimony. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord God and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order... To forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abundant loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. Well, that sounds familiar. The Lord said, do, do you have good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under in, in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. But Jonah was extremely happy uh, about this plant. But God appointed a worm, and dawn came the next day and attacked the plant and withered. And when the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die. <laughs> Strange. Saying, death is, better for me to, death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Really? Really? Verse 10, then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on nine 
Uh, Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and their left hand as well as many other animals. And I read that and I think to myself, why is there nothing else written about Jonah's ministry? There's not even a response to this question. There's just nothing. It just ends. Why? I can't wait to go to heaven. I can't wait to find out what actually happened to Jonah and the rest of his life, you know? Uh, like Judas Iscariot, like Judas Iscariot, uh, this, this story about this prophet, it just ends with a very sad note. Jonah would rather die. Jonah wants to exit. Jonah is still struggling to rectify his own compassion for others, even though he makes an amazing prayer in chapter 2. It's just this, this sad reality of someone who still doesn't get it. Even though he went out and preached against wickedness to Nineveh, and the whole city repents. He still hasn't resolved his heart yet. He, he still hasn't resolved his ministry yet. He still, he still hasn't figured out what real true repentance looks like. And I, and I just am graciously saying that that's probably why nothing else is written. It's just like, and then? And there isn't an end there. Because he would rather die than face up to the reality of the sin that lives inside of his heart. And that's the saddest point for this whole prophet, is that you could be a leader, a really great leader, a leader that could do an amazing thing, and harbor wickedness in your heart, not find true repentance, and, and, um, and really, even though Jonah was given this one opportunity to be a great man of God, your, 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 your ministry or your ability to speak in the lives of other people or to be respected just closes. Just gone. You know? Because I think people can really see the truth. People can really see through the veil that we put up. And we can say, I know the tenure of this person's life. They are, there is no good fruit in their life. There's only bad fruit. And you can pick it off of his life in multiple different places, you know. And although we kid ourselves and think to ourselves, and nobody else sees how evil of a person I am, eh, beg to differ. I think people know a good tree when they see a good tree and a bad tree when they see a bad tree. And, and it's a sad story for this book of Jonah. I just wish that he had more to give, more to say, more to do to build God's kingdom. We'll leave that in the hands of Almighty God, and not that it's appropriate to pray for Jonah in this moment because he's been long dead, but uh, I would love to resolve this conflict with him someday. Father God, we thank, of you, thank you for your scripture, Lord, and here we've just been talking about the exchange of sin. Lord, we want to not have that kind of hard reality in our life. Lord, help us not to exchange the good things in this life for something that will reduce and limit and constrain your kingdom for sure. Lord, help us to walk as people in the light. Help us to do everything right that we possibly can. Help us to live in obedience to your spirit and to your will. Pray for all these things in Christ's name. Amen.